darkness is no match for light. My family and I got back from a vacation last Sunday. We had an awesome time in Florida and, and enjoyed the beach, but one of the coolest things that we got to see while we were down there was a night launch of a SpaceX rocket from Cape Canaveral. Now, many of you may have heard that, that we launched our first couple of astronauts into space in like 10 years, uh, so there's kind of a, a buzz around the area where we were staying. Now, this launch went off at like 9.35 p.m. or something like that, I think, the, the launch that we saw, uh, and they were sending a, a satellite up into, into space. Now, we walked down to the, to the beach area where, during the daytime, you could see the Air Force Base uh, down the coast really, really clearly, but, but it was a cloudy day, and now it's nighttime, and it's completely dark. So, so we're basically just kind of staring into the darkness in the direction where we knew the launch was going to happen. Now, one of the things that you can do during the launches, which is really cool, is you can go on to the SpaceX website and, and kind of track the launch sequence as they begin to count down. Well, as we got down to the very end of it, at about 10, 9, 8, 7, I remember thinking, I really hope we can see this. <laughs> it was so dark that, that, that I was actually really fairly doubtful that we would have any kind of a, a good visual of that. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a rocket launch at night, but the second that the countdown hit zero, I had zero doubt that we were going to be able to see the launch. Clearly, I had underestimated the power of light. Instantly, the entire horizon lit up as this, this, this glowing white fireball ascended directly vertically into the sky until it was out of sight. Just a few moments later, the whole thing lasted about 60 seconds. But the burden of my heart for us this morning, as we approach our passage, is that we, as children of light, would not underestimate the transforming power of light as it shines in the darkness. As dark as this world may sometimes seem, brothers and sisters, the light of the world, that is Jesus, the Son of God, has overcome the darkness. And that is the place that we ultimately find our hope. Our passage this morning is from Ephesians 5. I'm going to be covering the back, the back end of verse 8 through verse 10, but really this particular section goes down to about verse 14, so I want, I want to read the whole thing. You can kind of think as my message this morning as, as part one, and then Art next week will be preaching part two of this particular section. So then hear the word of Almighty God. Our Father in heaven, our good and gracious King. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is Shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Father, would you use our time gathered together now? in this particular passage, to increase our confidence in the reality that you have overcome the darkness. Would you give us increased faith and increased strength to do whatever it is that you are calling us to do in our families and in our church and in our community? 
And we ask these things through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. So, again, we'll just be concentrating on 8 through 10. And the, the essence of this short little section here is that it is pleasing to God when His children reflect His light in a dark world. Now, that's straightforward enough, but, but let's press into a couple of details so that, that the full power of this charge falls on us as we work through our passage this morning. So we'll take a little bit of time to look at the language of walking and of light, and then we'll look at the nature of light, specifically in Ephesians. We're talking about what is good and right and true, and then finally we'll look at how all this relates to pleasing the Lord, that is, pleasing our Father in heaven as His children. So let's begin by pressing into the the concept of walking in light. G.K. Chesterton once said, The issue is now clear. It is between light and darkness, and everyone must choose his side. One of the more dramatic ways that the Bible talks about the radical nature of what's happening out in the world and what's happening even within our own hearts is a battle between the kingdoms of light and of darkness. One of the more shocking revelations of the Bible is that all people, all people start out as citizens of the kingdom of darkness. Chapter 2 of Ephesians opened with these words, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children not of light, but of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's quite the spiritual buzzkill. If your fundamental problem is that you are self-referenced. But note the similarity of language in Ephesians 2 to our passage in Ephesians 5. We walked in this sinful condition. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And as children of wrath, we shared a condition with the rest of mankind. This is where we all started. In other words, this is why the reality that Paul has been describing in in the book of Ephesians is such a miracle. In order to do any of the things that we are exhorted to do here in this world, God first had to do a miracle in us. To be clear, we were not talking about walking around or living in actual darkness before we came to Jesus. Rather, Ephesians 2 is describing a a sinful spiritual condition, a condition marked by, by ignorance and by error and by willful evil. Maybe think about Hollywood or something like that. I know that's a little bit of low hanging fruit there, but it contains it contains the brightest stars and the the most glittery lifestyles. But in many ways, It perpetuates the darkest darkness. John Newton put it this way, There are many who stumble in the noonday, not for want of light, but for want of eyes. But, of course, this is not just a Hollywood problem. We all needed to have our our blind eyes opened. God's Spirit had to do a work in us in order for us to even be able to see true spiritual light. God who said, let light shine out of darkness, for those of us who are believers, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But that wasn't always the case. So maybe you have a... a 
family member or a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker who's been exposed to the gospel many times over. Maybe you yourself are the very person who shared the light of the truth of God's word with them multiple times. And, and you feel discouraged because you think, I'm always praying the same thing over and over and over again. May I suggest that perhaps you shift the focus of your prayers from, from, from asking for yet another opportunity to share light with them to praying that God will give them eyes to see the light that has been shared with them. Pray that they will, that they will see, that they will see the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Whereas before, they may not have shown any interest in the gospel, or Jesus may not have seemed to have any worth to them whatsoever. Pray that God will open their eyes like he opened your eyes to see the wonder and the beauty and the relevancy of Jesus. When our eyes were open to the hope that we have now in Jesus, when, when we expressed faith in Jesus or came into union with Christ, to, to use the language of Ephesians, what happened at the level of kingdom authority was that we were instantly qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. God delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1, 12 through 14. That's how dramatic and decisive this action was and is. While we were children of wrath, sons of disobedience, walking in sin, living in the kingdom of darkness, we were unable to see the glory of God's kingdom. Maybe you're a young person here, or maybe you've been going to church for your whole life, and you think, that all sounds like really dramatic language. I'm just not that interested. I'm just not that sure about Jesus. That's precisely what I'm talking about. Think back to what caught your attention or what was interesting to you before you came to Christ. What kind of philosophies of the world or practices just seem like, makes sense to me. All seems like common sense. can't believe people get so worked up about these kinds of things. And then think for a moment about now how you see those very same things. Dramatically different. The the only real difference, those, those truths haven't changed. The only difference is at one time you were blind, but now you see. God opened your eyes to see the greatness of the glory of Jesus revealed in his word. So pray, pray for those that you long to see come to Christ. Pray that their eyes would be opened to the truth. In our Ephesians passage, when we combine the ideas of of walking with light and especially as we picture children walking in light, it it brings to mind the imagery of of, of motion or of imitation, chapter 5 and verse 1, or of growth or or, or progress as we grow up into Christ, chapter 4 and verse 15. Just think about it really simply for a moment to see, to think about what Paul is actually trying to communicate to us. To walk from one place to another means typically we're walking away from something and walking towards something else. So, in one sense, this is just another way of saying put off the old self and put on the new. Because he loves teaching in contrasts. Now, broadly speaking, we are walking away from the kingdom of darkness and toward the kingdom of light. 
But more specifically, what are we walking away from? There may be practices or ideas that we love. The call to become a Christian is a radical call. As we learn to walk, you may be in a place where you're just still toddling. Maybe you're walking and sometimes we feel like we're sprinting and other times it feels like we're standing still just trying not to turn around and go back the other direction. But the more light comes in, the more it pushes out the darkness and we are conformed into the image of Christ. Once we are in union with Him because of what God has done for us in Christ, we are therefore exhorted to walk in the light or to pursue righteousness or to follow Jesus. We are first changed and then we are challenged. God does a miracle in us and then does miracles through us as we engage the world with the light of His Word. John told us that Jesus is the true light who came to give light to all people. And Jesus himself said, I I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That is such a hopeful promise, brothers and sisters. Therefore, as followers of Jesus, we are called to reflect the light of God to the world. Paul even says it more amazingly than that at the beginning of verse 8. He says, we are light now in the world. In Christ, we have been so radically transformed from, from living in darkness as children of wrath that we can now actually be used by God himself to shine light into the darkness. Brothers and sisters, that... That is what has happened to every one of you who named the name of Christ. You have been radically transformed by God. He has done a miracle in you to the glory of His great name. But in the context of our passage, what does it specifically mean to reflect the light of God or to shine light into darkness? In our passage, Paul, he mentions three things. Verse 9, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So by using the phrase, the fruit of light, it shows that the light does not originate with us. Rather, the root is the work of God in us, which yields the fruit of the light of all that is good and right and true in our lives. Now, now verse 9 may not appear to be worded in a particularly offensive way. In fact, if you read it, it seems kind of benign. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. But I can assure you, that from the standpoint of the world, if we adhere to these truths, it's very offensive. Because what we're saying as believers in light of this passage is that everything that is good and everything that is right or righteous or just and everything that is true is ultimately found in the one and only true and living God and in His revealed world. word. That is a powerful declaration of truth. Think about how radical that actually is. Of course, once we come to Christ in light of who God is, it just sounds like perfectly clear thinking. <laughs> Here are the implications of that, though, and this is where it gets difficult. What this practically means is that if an idea or statement or message or practice or a book or work of art or philosophy or ideology or institution 
or the values of an organization or a movement, if it's consistent with the Word of God, then in principle it is good, assuming that it not only aligns with what is good and right and true according to God's Word, but it is also communicated and lived out in a manner that is also consistent with the standard of love expressed in God's Word as well. But what it also means is that an idea or statement or message or practice or book or work of art or philosophy or ideology or institution or organization or movement that opposes God's Word, if it stands in opposition to God's Word, no matter how passionate people are about it, it is inherently not good. But think about how hard these types of things are to figure out. Uh, and to assess with the complexity and nuance and speed of, of some of the major issues that we face in the world and in, in our nation, and that we have faced just within the last few years. Some of these things seem decades old, but really they've just happened over the past several months, or a little bit more than that. Things like the rise and fall of terrorist organizations, the Me Too movement, Budget crises in our nation, because a budget is always a reflection of your values. Immigration policies, election interference allegations, environmental proposals. I mean, even to get accurate information to assess these things is hard. Or consider consider just this year. One cultural commentator described 2020 like this. 2020 started out like 1974 with an impeachment crisis, quickly became 1918 with a pandemic, turned into 1929 with an economic crash, and is now 1968 with massive urban unrest. And brothers and sisters, it's June. (laughs) Issues are so polarizing today, especially with the way the news is communicated and the way social media is utilized, it becomes very difficult for followers of Jesus to discern what is constructive from what is destructive. In our current cultural climate, there are, there are definitely examples of both outstandingly good things and flagrantly bad things. But so many of the things that we engage with are a mixture of both. What do we do? I think the first thing to remember is that the things that we face today as a nation and that we face as a world over the last couple of years didn't originate with the headlines of the last few weeks. This is a problem that the world has faced that goes way, way, way back, like back to Adam and Eve who were in the garden with God and had sons named Cain and Abel. And one of the sons killed the other. These problems go way, way back. Within the flow of Ephesians, we as followers of Jesus are called to shine the light of goodness and justice and truth into a darkened world. That's straight out of verse 9. The challenge is that within the flow of the culture, it is not always clear what is good and just and true. I mean, some things are obvious. Racism is evil. And it is wrong. And it is disgusting. And it is opposed to the kingdom of God in every form. Further, we can, we can listen and, and show compassion and, and speak where it is right to do so. But discerning <clears throat> what to do specifically can be, can be challenging. Sometimes we feel like we have to do something. We have to do anything to help any way we can show support, and sometimes that's right and that's good. Yet at the same time, we need to reflect on the the best way, the best way to affect change. As believers, we are not called to virtue 
signaling. We are called to actually be virtuous. We are called to show compassion and, and empathy, not to call out people who, who think differently. We are called to boldly proclaim the truth, not blindly affirm people in their truth. And we are called to personally fight for a just cause, not to ignore injustice, just because. May God give us so much wisdom as we seek to bring the light of God's word to bear in our discussions during these challenging times with our family and co-workers and friends and our neighbors. Our goal, our end goal, is not necessarily to bring someone over to our side on an issue, but to shine the light of God's word into a situation so that we and the other people we are talking to do have talking to have the opportunity to calibrate our thoughts around what God says is good and right and true. In all these things, we are seeking to please our Father and focus as a church on preaching the gospel and making disciples who live and act and think in a manner that is consistent with what God says is good and right and true. That has been our focus, that is our focus, and that will always be our primary focus. If we look back at our verses for, for a moment, verses 8 through 10 here, and, and we take out the parenthesis in the middle, which would be verse 9, for the sake of clarity we get to see the connection between verses 8 and 10. And I think the best way to translate this verse is simply like this. Walk as children of light, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Right? That's super clear and straightforward. Maybe I should have just said at the beginning, you know, just said that at the beginning and we'd be, we'd be good to go. Walk as children of light, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. But what if someone asked you, well, how? How do I discern what is pleasing to the Lord? How can I know the will of God? That type of question. The idea of discerning here is about evaluating or testing or approving what is good and right and true as the means of walking or living in the light. In other words, Paul is not saying here, look, walk as children of light, and then tacking on at the end, oh, and try to discern what the will of the Lord is. What he's, what he's actually saying is, as we walk through that process, as we are beholding what is good and right and true in God's word. And as we think about how does that apply in my life and in my community where I live, as we think about those things and attempt to discern what is most pleasing to our Father in heaven, we are walking as children of light. These things are inextricably connected together. In some ways, it's, it's the same thing because all we're talking about is a day in the life of a Christian. <laughs> We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about seeking to do what is right according to God's word and then seeking to be led by the Spirit to do that very thing in every area of our life. What discerning doesn't mean is that as God's followers, we're just doing the best we can to kind of figure out what God wants us to do. J.A. Packer gets to the essence of this difference when he writes, we are to order our lives by the light of his law, not by our guesses about his plan. In other words, it's a very gracious thing that God has given us the light of his word so that we can know and understand and discern what his will is. It is that which is aligned with what is good and right and true revealed in his word. This idea of evaluating or testing or approving is similar to Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and 
perfect. You see the parallel thought there? Or Philippians 1, 9 through 11 is possibly even clearer. And it is my prayer that your love will abound more and more with all knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Same exact idea. This passage from Philippians makes it clear that the fruit of righteousness comes through Jesus. Because of our union with Jesus, because of the righteous root of his work on our behalf, the beautiful fruit of righteousness can be displayed in our lives. As we walk in the light of God's word, we become more and more able to evaluate accurately and to approve of what is good and right and true. Then, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we trust in Jesus, we more and more and more become able to actually choose that which is good and right and true and live in light of those things, knowing that they will please and honor our Father in heaven. In verse 10, we learn that we are to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Or since we're talking about children of light, it might be even more precise to say we're seeking to do what pleases our Father in heaven. But if your mind's kind of churning on this idea, or if your heart is kind of swirling as you're, you're thinking about this, and you're immediately moving towards, well, how, how do I do this? What, what, what does this look like? Pause for a moment to simply rejoice. Much like Jill was exhorting us to earlier. Consider what a miracle it is that we can please our Father in heaven at all. In light of what we talked about in Ephesians 2, the reason I was belaboring that point is so that when we get to this spot, we say, wait a minute, stop. That's a miracle. I can discern what's pleasing to God in heaven? Yes. We can through the power of the Holy Spirit as we examine his word. This is an absolute miracle. Formerly, we were children of wrath and sons of disobedience. Now, we are adopted sons and daughters of the King of glory who delights in us. And we delight to find out what's pleasing to him. So just let that reality That is the reality of the good news of the gospel. Just wash over you this morning. Because we are not children who, in fear, try to do what our Father wants us to do because we're scared of Him punishing us for doing what's wrong or even punishing us for doing what's right, just doing it really poorly. It's reflected in this this haunting feeling that so many of us carry around every day that I know God loves me, I just feel like He's constantly disappointed with me. That's not true if you are in Christ. Rather, because of the gospel, because of our union with Christ, because through the cross our sins have been forgiven, and because we have been declared righteous in Jesus, and because we have been adopted by the Father, and because we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and because we are in fellowship with the triune God, and because God is and will be our inheritance forever. And because we are now loved and accepted and adored and innocent and free in Christ, we find our greatest joy in seeking to please our perfect Father, the Father of heavenly lights. Our motivator is freedom, not fear. Brothers and sisters, as we, as we think about what it looks like to live these things out in this day and age, I want you to be confident if you are in Christ, confident in the power of the Holy Spirit, because I don't want you to underestimate the power of light shining into the darkness. This is the plan. This is how you came to faith in Christ. 
Frankly, Jesus has reconciled the world to himself. So we need to point people to his work. Think about complete darkness. And think about how much one singular point of light is visible in the midst of that darkness. Your single, simple testimony to a friend or a co-worker or somebody who lives in your neighborhood can make all the difference in the world. Think about when you have not been able to see that the, the tiniest, the smallest light is exactly what you needed in order to be able to see clearly enough to navigate your path. So as we commit to live from day to day and moment by moment as children of light in a dark world through the power of the Holy Spirit, As we do these things, as we as children of light testify, reflect the light of our Father in heaven, perhaps the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings and heal our nation. May God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, both now and and forevermore. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so dependent upon you. Even as we we think about standing strong and reflecting your light in our community, with compassion and grace and love, we recognize our own frailties and fears and lack of ability to see things clearly. And so we confess our entire dependence upon you. We recognize that we too were children of wrath. And now we are light in the Lord Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us and embolden us to stand for what is good and right and true. And give us wisdom about how to do that in a manner that is wholly pleasing to you. Then we ask these things through the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.